co-owner of a company named uh, Jones Dykstra and Associates. And uh, I have a business partner. His name is Brian Dykstra. And I have the title of senior partner here. Let me start with the broad subject first. That's going to be e-discovery. Uh, in 2006, there were some federal rules that changed that basically makes um, you know, civil lawsuits have to deal with electronic data uh, during a trial. So what happens is um, if you have two parties suing each other, one party has a right to, well, actually both parties have a right to discovery, but one party may say, I want you know all the emails that have to do with a certain subject. Uh, so that's where e-discovery comes in, and I try to use the analogy if, if you've never heard of it before. It's kind of like walking into a barn full of hay and just grabbing out a handful of just relevant hay and handing it to somebody so that they can do the review. Now, if we go to computer forensics, it's more uh, granular than that. So if we're talking about putting our arms around the relevant hay in e-discovery, we're not talking about trying to find that needle out of the haystack. Then the third thing I mentioned a little earlier was computer security, which, as you can see, all these things I'm mentioning aren't mutually exclusive. So you may start in discovery sense, and then you go, uh-oh, we found something that we got to investigate, and you'll move more into a computer forensic type of investigation from that. And in some aspects, there's um, computer security, which is, um, if you've seen in the news, you know, so-and-so company um, may have exposed X amount of credit cards. Well, somebody usually has to investigate that and figure out, you know, what what data was exposed, how much of it was exposed, what does that mean for the company, do we have to notify the credit card holders and so forth. So there's a, a technical aspect behind that where you do that reactive type of investigation in a security breach. When I went through the university, they didn't have computer forensics as a, uh, a profession per se. You couldn't leave with a degree that said, you know, I, I do computer forensics, but what I did was um, you know, pretty early in my career, I liked the electrical engineering and computer engineering aspect of things. And um, so I have a dual bachelor's degrees, uh, one in computer engineering, one electrical engineering. Um, myself, I, I worked at the School of Criminal Justice at Michigan State University when I was there. And I was always interested in the, uh, uh, you know, the computer crime side of things. And I stayed around for my master's degree in electrical engineering. but. Um, what that allowed me to do was then apply the um, computer side or the technical side of things to the legal profession. So investigating computers and, and so forth. You typically see um, people in this profession either have one or the other. They're either an investigator and they come in and learn the technical aspect or they're a technical person and they learn the investigative aspects. The nice thing is is the, the people that are, are graduating now are they grew up with computers, so teaching them the, the technical aspect um, is a lot easier than somebody who never you know, touched a computer in their life. So if you take your average college student, they never know what you know, Facebook, Twitter, all those things are, and what you do is you have to teach them um, you know, specifics about maybe different operating systems, but they already have an understanding of things like evidence management and so forth that um, they've already learned in their, in their college career. My average day is a little different because um, being, being an owner of a company, it encompasses all that of, of running a company. So uh, the more um, associate level employee, the ones that don't have to worry about finances and all that of the company, um, that get to work on the, the data from day to day. The, um, you know, the typical day is uh, you'll have a, a project or two uh, floating around and it's, it's usually not the case that we'll have just one project working. So an employee may be working on two to four projects simultaneously. And you've got to take that with a grain of salt. Um, in the legal world, things don't move very quickly. So if I'm working on four projects, I may not work on two of them that week because we gave data to an attorney or a business manager that has to make a decision. And we're just waiting for them to look at what we gave them, come back to us and say, okay, now I'd like you to look at so-and-so's laptop. Um, well, first and foremost, uh, communication skills. Um, I'm, I can say this because I'm a technical guy, but uh, at least in my era when, when, when technical people were being developed, um, you're more of an uh, introvert maybe. And um, there will be times where you know, you're, you're presenting your findings to a group of people and you've got to be comfortable with maybe 10 people watching you um, while you're, you're presenting that finding. And then later on, 
Um, if you do testimony, you might have a whole courtroom of people and news people there that are watching you give your testimony. So um, communication, I think, is key, and being comfortable giving that communication is key. The other traits are um, being able to be multifaceted, being, uh, being able to uh, understand the legal world plus your technical world. I find a lot of times there might be a disconnect if someone's very heavily technical or someone's very heavily in the legal world. So that usually helps. Um, a lot of times what we do is we're a translator. We'll talk to the IT staff for a client and then we'll talk to the attorneys for the same client and put it in attorney language versus uh, technical language. As you progress in your career, uh, you're not always just sitting in front of a computer. Um, you can do the greatest things ever on a computer in an investigation, and if nobody understands it, you know, it really it doesn't matter. But what's important is the fact that somebody understands what you did was so great. Um, and the other is, uh, I didn't really grow up with it, but now that's all over TV, you have, you know, CSI and so forth. Um, and computer forensics isn't as cool as it looks on TV. You know, it's a lot of pressing page down button and, and arrow down and mark and so forth. So just be aware of that, that there aren't a lot of flashing screens and a lot of 3D renderings and so forth. There's been a lot of changes. I mean, any, anytime you talk about a technical field, there's, there's a lot of changes. Um, even uh, anything as simple as, um, you know, Facebook becoming more popular, we're going to see more cases that will involve questions about Facebook. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get evidence from there, but it's just one another one of those avenues that lawyers have heard of and they'll ask for um, any type of information that might be able to come from it. Um, probably the biggest change that I see right now concerning computer forensics specifically is uh, regulation. Right now because computer forensics e-discovery are, are so new it's for lack of a better phrase sort of like the wild wild west. You can, you can set up a shop and say you do it even though you have zero experience in it. Um, what's, what's happening is instead of there being a regulatory body for it, you're seeing the different states and the 50 states out there saying, all right, this is going to be our rule for the state of what? And that's going to get very, very difficult, I think, for a lot of people because you could find yourself on a case where you just have to stop oh, legally so you don't get in trouble because it's a criminal offense uh, if it goes into a different state. That, that to me, is probably the biggest um, hurdle we're seeing right now. Well, hopefully we will get this regulation issue figured out. On the technical aspect, um, where you're going to see, uh, I think, investigations everywhere. You know, back in the day, we only worked on computers, and then smartphones came out, and now we're doing, regularly, we're doing computer forensics on smartphones. So as, as technology, uh, as it progresses, and new devices, new tools, new operating systems come out, there's usually new investigative steps for whatever that particular device, tool, or software is. The Anti-Hanger Toolkit was a uh, book I wrote uh, that basically outlines all the different security tools. So out of the three things I mentioned up front, I talked about e-discovery, I talked about computer forensics, I talked about computer security. This more falls in the computer security realm, and it has a little bit of computer forensics in there because I talked about tools in there. But it's more of a, um, a shop manual, if you will. The other book, which is newer, is the um, Real Digital Forensics, and we developed that, um, I want to say, in the 2004, 2005 time frame. One of the things that I think is really important is you just have to get your hands on some data and basically play with it. Figure out what the data looks like, what's normal, what's not normal. So what we did is we have some uh, basically made up scenarios, realistic cases, but made up scenarios of different companies that had different things happen to them. And we provided data on a DVD there so that way um, as the book walks you through it, you can use different tools to walk through it. Yeah, I can tell you what I usually tell my staff, and that's um, volunteer for probably the project nobody wants if you're new, um, because you'll learn a lot. Um, another thing is getting exposure to actually doing the work in any way possible will usually help you. And there's different ways of going about it. Um, if you're working at a place that um, you, know, you need help or they need help at a certain point, you know, volunteer to, to help on it, help, help out on it. Um, shadow somebody if you can. So that's that's usually the best way to get your um, your foot in the door, I think.